Hello and welcome to the Dynasty Vipers Vipercast Starts and Sits edition here for week number 10. Joining me momentarily will be Mrs. Fantasy herself, Tara Roberts, but let's go over some of the news and notes from the week that was. Starting with the biggest news, Kyler Murray looks like he's going to be back for the Arizona Cardinals, as to James Conner, who is also activated from the PUP. So now the time to buy uh, Trey McBride and... Marquise Hollywood Brown, that window is now closing, but that doesn't mean you don't have to give about a week's worth of balance because we know it's going to take Kyler Murray some time to get his legs back under him coming off that ACL injury. So it's going to be a bit of a learning curve this week as far as fantasy is concerned. So you do have a little bit of a window here still to operate, but that window is closing people. We've also got news that Justin Jefferson, he too has been activated from the PUP and will be looking to join the Minnesota Vikings within the next 21 days. What that means is do not expect Justin Jefferson to be playing here in week number 10. We were told from the get-go that this was a four- to six-week type injury, so I'm erring on the side of caution here and predicting this to be closer to six weeks than it is to four weeks. Heading into week 10, we know that there are going to be some issues here with your fantasy football lineups. We've got four teams on by, and there are some big-name fantasy contributors on those four teams. For the Philadelphia Eagles, we are without Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and DeAndre Swift. We also lost ourselves uh, Dallas Goddard there due to injury here last week. For the Miami Dolphins, that means no Tua Tagovailoa, no Tyreek Hill, no Raheem Mostert, and no Jalen Waddell. Again, Los Angeles Rams, we are going to be without Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua. And of course, for the Kansas City Chiefs, that means no Travis Kelsey, no Patrick Mahomes. So what can we do? We will help you throughout the rest of this show to talk about which players you can trust to insert in your lineups to fill in those bi-week blues here for week number 10. Now, I did mention that we are going to be without Dallas Goddard. He had a broken forearm. He's out for the next probably few weeks here. And really, there's no other option there in Philadelphia. So that's going to be a big, big, big time piece of information here as we move throughout the show. When we look at players to buy and sell moving on throughout the rest of the season, we also know that we lost Daniel Jones to an ACL injury. He is out for the rest of the season. Other news to talk about, we've got a Thursday night football game where we have the Carolina Panthers and the Chicago Bears. All kinds of injuries around this game. Justin Fields, he is not going to play this week. He's still got the thumb injury. We thought there was a chance that he could make it back for this game, but the Bears are going to give him the extra week to get right. On the Carolina Panthers side, DJ Chark, he looks like he's going to miss this game with an elbow injury, as well as Brian Burns. He is out due to concussion. That is a huge injury for the Carolina Panthers and that pass rush. Now, looking back at the week that was, let's talk about the quarterback position. C.J. Stroud, 51 fantasy points, nearly 500 passing yards, five touchdowns. Yes, that is real. He is going to be a QB1 the rest of the season. How about Josh Dobbs? Hey, coming off the street there, being traded, and then automatically coming in and contributing for the Minnesota Vikings, posting 28 fantasy points while not taking a snap at all. That's impressive. We knew that this dude was smart, but he is fantasy productive, but I expect that to continue. Maybe not as a top 12 fantasy quarterback, but a quarterback you can stream each and every week at the running back position. Rashad White, he is the RB11 in PPR formats this season. So let's put a little respect on his name. RB1 last week, 73 rushing yards, 36 receiving yards, and a pair of touchdowns. Keaton Mitchell there, waiver wire darling, RB5, 138 yards rushing, nine carries. I do not expect that to continue moving forward. This is still Gus Edwards' thing. Uh, Keaton Mitchell was still out snapped by Justice Hill. So do not go out there and think that Keaton Mitchell is a guy you can automatically plug and play in your fantasy lineups. And then at the wide receiver position, Tank Dell, six catches, 116 yards, two touchdowns. If you look at what he has done since joining the Houston Texans throughout his first seven career games, he has the second most receiving yards among any Texans pass catchers, 454 yards. That is more than DeAndre Hopkins, 416. And that is just a few yards shy of Andre Johnson's 495 yards through his first seven career games. So if you're looking for that boom and bust play each and every week, it's Tank Dell. You can put him in your lineup, but guess what? He can give you 20 fantasy points just as easily as he can give you zero. And on the opposite side of him, we know that Nico Collins has been good, but how about Noah Brown? Six catches, 153 yards, and a touchdown. Both Tank Dell and Noah Brown were top three fantasy wide receivers last week. Another big surprise at the wide receiver position for week number nine was Jahan Dotson, who not only had a touchdown, but had four catches for 69 yards, and he found himself in the top 12 as far as wide receivers are concerned. 
I am definitely not expecting him to be a top option moving forward, especially if Curtis Samuel returns to his Washington Commanders offense. But the passing volume, it is going to be there. Washington, Sam Howell. Sam Howell is the quarterback six in fantasy right now. Who would have thought that he's got like literally two games in which he has produced fewer than 16 fantasy points? I think that was week three and week number seven. So you know that this Washington Commanders offense is going to throw the ball around the field. Unfortunately, I don't think the volume is going to be there for Dotson once Samuel comes back. But until Samuel comes back, Dotson is a guy you can easily plug and play into your flex position. Now, looking back throughout the season and through week number nine, what is the one thing that has me the most excited? It has been Josh Jacobs, who, despite missing all of training camp and getting off to a slow start, somehow, some way, I mean, he hasn't had a bye week yet, but somehow, some way, he is the RB4 in fantasy football right now in PPR formats. That is impressive. He has 16 and a half or more fantasy points in four of the last six games. Now, this week, it's going to be tough against the New York Jets, but guess what? New York, they'll be focusing on guys like Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers. So this could be one of those games in which Josh Jacobs maybe doesn't have the rushing yards because we know that the Jets can shut that down, but he may be a PPR machine there making an extension of the run game through the pass game. And that's where Jacobs is going to have it. He's like one of the top targeted running backs in the National Football League heading into week number 10. It's time for Tara Roberts to join me now as we talk about our must-start, must-sit players at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end, not to mention our buy low and sell high players entering week 10. So Tara, when we look around the fantasy landscape here heading into week number 10, who are some players that you're looking to buy low and sell high on? Um, my favorite one you kind of stole, but uh, TJ Hawkinson is one that I also love as well. He's a sneaky buy low because you don't think of buy low for somebody that is literally like the tight end three in overall points uh, and average points uh, per game in PPR, averaging 14.5 fantasy points per game. But because of the sentiment that people have around that Minnesota offense, Josh Dobbs, obviously a fantastic story. I mean, you guys, I'm sure we can talk about that ad nauseum, how wonderful that was. But we can't get away from the fact that he is a low volume quarterback and people generally don't believe in Josh Dobbs ability to support multiple high end fantasy assets. But I think if there's one person in particular that he can support, it's TJ Hawkinson, because when you look at the stats from Arizona under the time period that Dobbs was the quarterback for them. The leading target recipient was obviously Marquise Brown with 69 targets, but then the next two players were Zach Ertz and Trey McBride, like literally two and three with a total of 78 targets between them. So TJ Hawkinson absolutely has a ton of upside and his production could actually increase a little bit if we see him favored by Josh Dobbs. So I like buying in on TJ Hawkinson. If someone's a little panicked and they want to bail out. Yeah. The good thing about uh, TJ Hawkinson is we just talked about the beginning of the show here that Justin Jefferson, he was activated from the PUP opening his 21 day window. So now people may be thinking, Hey, Josh Dobbs, Jordan Addison, Justin Jefferson, where does TJ Hawkinson fit in here? You just kind of mentioned that the tight end was his number two read there in Arizona. This is something that could he, uh, you could use as a kind of a bargaining chip in trade negotiations. Now, what about that sell high player? My sell high is one that people are not going to like at all. It is, uh, it's to a tug of a loa. Um, unfortunately, and I've been this way for a while here. Like if you follow my content, you know, I have said multiple times, like when Tua has a good game, you need to consider bailing out and selling high because the problem is, is that while this is not a knock on Tua whatsoever, this is not a knock on Tua as a real football quarterback, fine football quarterback. But from a fantasy perspective, when he gets in these tough matchups, Buffalo, Philadelphia, Kansas City, he's a flop. 14, 10, 12 fantasy points, it's not good, unfortunately. He doesn't have that rushing upside of a guy like Josh Dobbs that we talked about to overcome a situation where he is unfortunately facing a very tough matchup. So he thrives in the good games. He struggles in the bad games from, because he's a pocket passer. It's not his it's not his fault from a fantasy perspective. It just is what it is. And if you're looking at the fantasy playoff schedule, it's the Jets. Obviously not a good team, but literally the worst matchup you can have from a pass perspective. The Cowboys, not a good matchup. Ravens, not a good matchup. Unfortunately, I don't feel comfortable starting Tua in the playoffs, sell them now. Get rid of them. 
Yeah, you're not wrong on that. We talked about Tua Tagovailoa being an MVP caliber quarterback. I mean, and he was. He was showing us everything that we wanted to see early on in the season. The problem with the Miami Dolphins as a whole is they're like 6-0 and against teams with sub-500 records, and yet they're 0-3 against teams with winning records. At some point, that's going to be telling us a little bit more of a story than maybe we are willing to hear right now. So one thing I am not willing to listen to is the fact that we've lost Dallas Goddard for a considerable period of time there with that forearm injury, which means – now is probably the time to go out there and get Devonta Smith, mostly because they are already on a buy. So people may, the news may not quite be registering with fantasy managers, but we know how good Devonta Smith has been when Dallas Goddard hasn't been available. This is literally, we talk about AJ Brown and Devonta Smith being a 1A, 1B if Dallas Goddard is not there. Well, guess what? Dallas Goddard is not going to be there. So now is the time that we can trust everything about Devontae Smith. I know he's been frustrating, so you may be able to get a fair price on him right now, especially for maybe a manager that is battling a playoff spot right now and needs the help today. So you probably can get a bit of a discount there. But you look at this, and I don't foresee Devontae Smith struggling the rest of the season. In four of the Eagles' nine games, Smith has been held to less than 10 fantasy points. Those days are gone. He's not going to be held to under 10 fantasy points the rest of the season, as long as Dallas Goddard is not in this lineup. And again, I'm going to piggyback off of the Miami Dolphins here, like you did with Tua Tagovailoa. And I'm going to say Raheem Mostert is that guy that I am looking to sell on right now. I don't believe, one, that he's going to continue to manufacture 19 fantasy points per game moving forward. And I find it even more difficult to believe that it's a possibility with Devin Chan coming back into this Miami Dolphins offense. Now, maybe that's more beneficial to Tua Tagovailoa having a Chan back, but that is detrimental to Raheem Mostert and fantasy circles. So for that, I am out on Raheem Mostert moving forward. Now, when we talk about players that we're in and out on, we have to talk about our Week 10 starts and sits, starting with the quarterback position. So, Tara, give me one start and one sit at the quarterback position for Week number 10. My start of the week is Will Levis. Yeah, so I'm going there. Now, granted, I mean, I could, when you're doing starts of the week, you could say all the superstar quarterbacks. You could go with them. It's easy. But if you're looking for a streaming option, if you're unsure of what direction to head, you can head towards Will Levis. Um, I, it, it, if it feels reactionary to you, I promise that it's not. Looking at that week eight performance, obviously in a good matchup with Atlanta, who, as we know, we, we are all frustrated with their team reeling and they just don't know um, that they're reeling and they're just, you know, failing to admit it right now. But he had four touchdowns. He was efficient. It was an overall good game. And then when he turned around and played Pittsburgh, you could look at the stat line and say it was a disappointing performance, but I don't really think it was. The rookie woes are going to happen. Interceptions are going to happen. He's a brand new quarterback. Sometimes they're going to be shaky plays. But overall, the poise was there. He looked like a starting quarterback. The yardage was there. He had 262 yards. He handled high volume in a difficult matchup with the Pittsburgh defense that can really get at you sometimes, especially with their pass rush. Uh, he would have had um, even higher yardage, would have surpassed that 300-yard mark, had a touchdown maybe if Tajay Spears didn't drop that weird uh it was such a strange play he was stumbling backwards and fell and it was right to him it should have been a catch should have been a touchdown there deep play at the very least that stat line would have been a lot different you would have definitely been looking at him as someone that you felt very comfortable starting and we're talking about a matchup against tampa bay a tampa bay that was absolutely lit up in um, a shocking disturbing kind of way by cj stroud last week a literally career performance there for the young rookie i expect Will Levis to maybe not at the same level of CJ Stroud, but at a good level to be able to take advantage of this matchup here. And my sit of the week is going to be Deshaun Watson. Um, it was good to see him come back. It was. And I don't take too much stock into the numbers <laughs> because from a, from a fantasy perspective, Arizona is one of those weird matchups where you might not necessarily have high pass volume against them because they're just a bad team and it's easier to run on them as well. Uh, so quarterbacks performances against Arizona aren't really a good barometer, but quarterback performances against this matchup here in Baltimore, I wouldn't do it. He is going to Baltimore, which is already a bad sign for a guy like Amari Cooper. Um, and Baltimore's defense is just we're we're underrating the true NFL performance that Baltimore is putting on right now. They've come into their own. The defense is thriving. The offense is doing well overall. I don't expect 
Cleveland to really compete in this game, honestly. They're going to try, but I don't think the level is going to be there, unfortunately. And I struggle to see Deshaun thriving through the air. Uh, he'll have to get it on the ground here. So I'm not trusting him in this matchup. He is a sit for me. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There was Deshaun Watson. I kind of talked about him as being a sit uh, most of this week here. Uh, for me, I'm starting Jared Goff. He is getting the band back together this week. Not only is David Montgomery returning, but so are a pair of his offensive linemen there and center Frank Ragnall there and guard Jonah Jackson. Los Angeles, they are allowing the second most fantasy points to quarterbacks this season, allowing over 20 fantasy points per game. And then you have to factor that Jared Goff He's been hitting, the, he's got that deep ball completion rate over 57%. So you could you could basically go out there and say, hey, you know what? This Lions team, they are going to be able to produce this week against this Chargers team. A Chargers team that sits sixth in fantasy points allowed to tight ends, eighth in fantasy points allowed against wide receivers. Or sorry, let me back that up. Sixth against tight ends and wide receivers when it comes to fantasy points allowed. Eighth in fantasy points allowed to the running back position. And opposing backs, they've caught 58 of 76 targets for 426 yards this season. That means Sam Laporta, uh, Amonra St. Brown, Jameer Gibbs. You're starting all these guys as far as passing options are concerned. And we're going to be able to start a few more of these guys a little bit later. Now, I am sitting... Oh man, Tara, this one always hurts every time I have to bring it up. But it's 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 Trevor Lawrence again against the San Francisco 49ers. While the 49ers have been a team in which quarterbacks have been able to throw on, the addition of Chase Young to go opposite of Nick Bosa is enough for me to pivot away from this matchup. Lawrence has averaged just 15.3 fantasy points per game this season, and that's his 20th on a per game basis in fantasy. That's behind Josh Dobbs, Baker Mayfield, and yes, even Will Levis. Jacksonville, they have struggled in the red zone. This is why Lawrence has been so poor as far as fantasy is concerned. They've scored on less than 50% of their trips inside the 20 yard line. That means less than 50% of the time they're scoring touchdowns, they're settling for field goals, and we need those touchdowns for fantasy. Now, I want to believe in Lawrence. I, I really do. But he's had just two games with multiple passing touchdowns this season, and he only has nine passing touchdowns through eight games. So it's hard for me to get excited. And you know me, Tara. I'm, I get about as excited as anybody over just about anything right now, especially maybe mayo and coffee, for example. But I'm looking at this. If Bosa and if Bosa and uh, Young weren't enough to scare you away, this 49ers passing or scoring defense, it sits fourth in the National Football League. That should be enough to be like, hey, you know what? I am going to pivot away from this at all costs. Now, some other quarterback starts and sits for me this week. C.J. Stroud, we talked about him coming off that rookie performance there, 470 passing yards, five touchdowns, a 147 passer rating, and now he gets to face Cincinnati. I don't care how many points Cincinnati's allowing. This is a C.J. Stroud versus Joe Burrow contest. They're going to need to throw to stay in this, and I'm excited for it. And then another start for me this week involves the Washington Commanders game. The Washington Commanders are allowing over 20 fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks. They've allowed a league-high 19 passing touchdowns, so why wouldn't you get Geno Smith into your lineup? And, of course, three straight 24-plus fantasy point performances for Dak Prescott. Ride the hot hand here once again against the ailing New York Giants. Now, sits for me this week also include, and this one hurts because I'm excited about Kyler Murray moving forward, just not this week. Not his first week back in action in who knows how long, and he's coming back from an ACL injury. And not to mention, I think Call of Duty releases like in like three or four days here. So that's also going to factor into the equation ahead of Sunday. But look. We've had running quarterbacks come back from ACLs before and not produce. Donovan McNabb, he comes to mind. 10 fantasy points in his debut, only nine rushing yards. RG3, 20 fantasy points, only 24 rushing yards. Uh, Deshaun Watson, he had 40 rushing yards, but he only had 11 fantasy points. And Carson Wentz, when he came back from that ACL injury, only had 11 fantasy points in his debut. Perhaps Kyler Murray is the outlier, but I'm not willing to bet on it this week. Obviously, you have other options available because you probably grabbed Murray off of the waiver wire. So stick with that other option for one more week. That's all I'm asking. One more week there. Uh, Russell Wilson, he's been serviceable this season, but he's a sit this week. He's averaging 17 points. 3 fantasy points per game, but the Bills, they're allowing just 13.3 fantasy points per game, and that is the third fewest. Russell Wilson, sure, he threw three touchdowns last week, but his stat line also shows only 114 passing yards. I'm fading that, as well as Jordan Love versus Pittsburgh. You know this, Tara. 
as the resident Packer fan here, you cannot start Jordan Love against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't like it. Sure, he scored uh, 17 fantasy points in three weeks, but the Steelers defense, they've held opposing quarterbacks under 16 fantasy points in the last few weeks here as well. So I'm avoiding Jordan Love. Now, turning our attention to the running back position, who do you have starting and who do you have sitting? Surprisingly, I am uh, starting Ramondre Stevenson. I did last week, and it worked out there. <laughs> that matchup against Washington was juicy. Uh, just nine carries, but uh, 87 yards. Um, very impressive yards per carry. Nice big run there from him. Uh, rushing touchdown. Good Lord. Uh, that is so needed from him. The receptions were there as well with good yardage. Uh, you know, Ramondre Stevenson, unfortunately, the volume is just not going to be there. Um, this is like umpteenth weeks in a row where he's had 10 or slightly less carries. And it's not even such that Zeke got a whole lot of carries last week. It's just that this, this new England offense just doesn't understand and it's not capable of thriving, unfortunately. And Ramondre Stevenson is the most talented player in that offense at this point, other than my boy, Demarius uh, Douglas. But Outside of that, Stevenson has the most opportunity, and I like this matchup against Indianapolis. Indianapolis's defense has been struggling overall. Teams are able to take advantage of them. We saw them in a crazy shootout with um, Cleveland the other week. It's just, you know, it's it's surprising, but it is happening, and I think that Ramondre Stevenson is going to be able to take advantage of this Indianapolis defense again. And my sit of the week is going to be one that maybe surprises people. I don't care that we have lost Cam. I, well, t- let me stop that. I do care that we have lost Cam Akers for the season. I'm so sorry, Cam Akers. I do care about you and the fact that you have to go through another horrific Achilles injury. It's just poor, poor you. And it's a shame that there are certain players that just have this injury bug that will not let them will not let them live. But um, for Alexander Madison, I don't care that Cam Akers is gone. I will not start you, unfortunately. Um, Last week, he had a strong outing in terms of getting that touchdown um, and one good, you know, a good catch that had good yardage attached to it. But outside of that, man, I mean, we can't ignore the fact that this is, again, he averaged 2.7 yard, 2.75 yards per carry. That's not good. Volume will be there. He'll get, you know, 16 to 20 carries. That's that's wonderful. Congrats. If it's not going for anyone or for anywhere, that doesn't matter to us. And we also have to account the fact for that he is now in an offense with Josh Dobbs, who is a touchdown scoring machine on the ground. And while maybe that opens things up in terms of yardage, I don't know if Alexander Madison is the man to really take advantage of that and combine that with lack of touchdown opportunities. I just don't foresee it happening for him. I don't like the matchup against new Orleans. I will not be starting Alexander Madison this week. Funny. You mentioned that I put that, I put him down too, as one of my sits uh, later on in there. And I, I look at it like, the pro- biggest problem for me is the fact that a we got we just talked about this. We have all these players coming back, and we don't, but we don't have Justin Jefferson back this week. We don't have KJ Osborne. Those are two players that typically take a lot of attention away on defense on the defensive side of the ball. So basically, now we're looking at Jordan Addison versus uh, Marshawn Lattimore. We're looking at about TJ Hawkinson against the rest of the Saints uh, shutdown linebackers here. So that's another tough matchup. But then we look. And the rest of the attention for the Saints team is going to be fixated on Alexander Madison. And that is not a good thing for a running back that even though has had volume, has been absolutely horrible so far this season. But for me, we talk about, and I'm going to bring this around here a little bit later, it is easy to say when good players are going to produce in fantasy. Everyone can predict a good player. I want to take the low-hanging fruit here on this one as well. But it's hard. When we talk starts and sits, we want to find a good player that we are going to sit. But I want to talk about a good player that I'm starting this week, and it is Brees Hall against the Las Vegas Raiders. Look, Donta, we go back three weeks ago. Donta Foreman, 120 total yards, three touchdowns. Jameer Gibbs, 189 total yards and a touchdown while averaging 5.8 yards per carry on Monday Night Football. Then last week, in a blowout victory over the New York Giants, Saquon Barkley still put up 113 total yards. And we're looking at this, and despite just 60 total yards on uh, 14 touches last week, Hall, he's still my RB2 this week, heading into week number 10. The Raiders are allowing the fourth most fantasy points on a per-game basis to opposing running backs so far this year. Only the Raiders and the Broncos have allowed 
over 1,000 yards rushing to date. So you have to believe that the New York Jets will be looking to establish the run in this contest. Now, as far as sits are concerned, I am sitting Gus Edwards. Yes, it is hard to sit the bus here. It is hard to park him because he's been one of the hottest running backs in fantasy the last few weeks. I mean, it's hard to put him in your doghouse. It really is. But where else Because where else are you going to find five touchdowns from a player, not just a running back, but from any player in the last two weeks? But guess what? Cleveland, they are allowing the fourth fewest fantasy points to the position this season. And they're allowing just, what, 16.1 fantasy points per game. And he's going to have to find a way to split those fantasy points between Justice Hill and Keaton Mitchell. Mind you, Keaton Mitchell, he's still, like I said, getting out snapped by Justice Hill. Now, the Browns' defense... They are allowing under 90 rushing yards per game so far this season, and that factors into the equation. Not to mention they're allowing, I think, less than 82 yards per carry or, or 82 yards per game over the last couple of weeks. There are likely better options right now that provide more upside than this Ravens back. Now, as we take a look at some other running backs, I'm starting and sitting. An old rule used to be to avoid running backs against the Tennessee Titans run defense. Well, rules... They change. Rules are meant to be broken. And I'm not exactly sure if Rashad White is considered a running back. He's more of a wide receiver who lines up in the backfield. But Tennessee, they are allowing 20 fantasy points per game to the running back position over the last four weeks. And that includes the Steelers' duo last week of Najee Harris and Jalen Warren producing 189 total yards. White was utilized nicely last week, accounting for 73% of the Buccaneers' running back opportunities and has seen at least four targets in four straight games. David Montgomery, he's a start again this week. We talked about Frank Rag now and Jonah Johnson, or Jackson returning to this Lions offense. That means you can trust David Montgomery once again because you know. I think even though he's missed three games, David Montgomery still accounted for 39% of all the Detroit Lions carry so far this season. He's missed three games, so you know Dan Campbell, he's getting his big back there in David Montgomery back this week. He's getting two big offensive linemen. He's going to look to run the ball on a Chargers team that has allowed four rushing scores and 581 yards on the ground recently. Now, when we talk, not to mention, I told you, they've given up a lot of yards in the passing game as well. And then again, I think this is a week that we can trust Tony Pollard. Now, this game, this one could go south in a hurry based on game script like a lot of the Dallas Cowboys games have so far this season. But the last time that Tony Pollard was fantasy relevant was way back in week number one. His opponent that week was the New York Giants where he ran for 70 yards and had two rushing touchdowns. Now, we know that the Giants, they are allowing the third most fast backs, uh, points to backs this season at 23.26. So there is some room for him to produce this week. As far as running backs, I'm sitting. James Cook of uh, the Buffalo Bills, he's a sit. I'm not sure how you can start him. I'm not sure you can trust him. When a lot of an opportunity, he has been good. He's averaging 4.7 yards per carry. However, he hasn't ran for more than 70 yards since, I don't know, what, September 24th. So I suppose you could probably trust him in against the Denver Broncos. I personally wouldn't. That is too big a risk for me this week. And then Jerome Ford versus Baltimore. We talked about, Terry, you pointed out how good Baltimore has been as a pass team, uh, defending the pass. They're just as good, if not better, when it comes to defending the run. They're allowing less than 19 fantasy points per game to running backs this season. They're holding rushers under 92 rushing yards per game and 81 or less over the last three weeks. So if you're starting a Browns running back, you're probably better off maybe flexing Kareem Hunt in PPR leagues because I just don't like this matchup for Jerome Ford at all. Now let's turn around. We talked about passing backs. We talked about pass catchers. Let's talk about those wide receivers. Who are you starting? Who are you sitting? Uh, I mean, it's low hanging fruit, but if I'm starting Will Levis, I'm starting DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, I mean, the two go hand in hand. The output for DeAndre Hopkins is solely dependent on Will Levis. So if I'm in on him in this matchup against Tampa Bay, I am in on DeAndre Hopkins. Um, obviously, that week eight performance was incredible. Week nine, a little bit of a letdown. The targets were there, though, 11 targets. And I think that's the true key here. There is nobody else that Will Levis would love to throw to in this offense other than DeAndre Hopkins. Yardage was decent. I, I feel like this is a it's a nice baseline floor um, performance and what was a bad matchup. And here again, we've got this good matchup against Tampa Bay. I would expect an uptick in production. Maybe not a three touchdown game, but I think he'll get us one here. So DeAndre Hopkins is someone that I am starting this week. A sit for me this week, Matt, you're not going to like this one. It's your boy. Jacoby Myers, it has nothing to do with him, unfortunately. Um, he's just 
the New England Patriots circle of trust is gone. It's gone. Thank goodness. Right. I'm sorry. Um, but we're all so happy that it is gone, except for Jacoby Myers, because it's not benefiting him. Unfortunately, last week against the New York Giants, he was just the odd man out. Two receptions, five targets, 38 yards. I just don't believe that he's going to be a high volume guy in this offense again. I think we're going to see um, DeAndre Hopkins or De- Devonte Adams continue to be the target hog in this offense with Aiden O'Connell, and they're going to rely on that run game. They're going to have to, especially in this matchup against the Jets. Even if you felt like you could trust Jacoby Myers to maybe see an increase in terms of targets, not against the Jets, not against the Jets. You're not attacking them through the air. You're trying to do it on the ground. So we're going to get a heavy dose of Josh Jacobs and probably zero dose of Jacoby Myers, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm not big on Jacoby Myers or Devontae Adams. I'll talk about Devontae Adams here in a second because that Jets secondary is good. Sauce Gardner, DJ Reed, Michael Carter. There's nowhere to really throw on this Jets team. And they've basically shut down some of the best quarterbacks all season long. And Robert Sallow, he'll let you know that as well. Now, for me, there is not many guarantees in the National Football League or in fantasy. But one thing that is for certain, Mike Evans, he's going to have 1,000 receiving yards when the season ends. That's almost a guarantee each and every year. He's already at five or 594 through three weeks, and he's well on his way to eclipse 1,000 yards for the 10th consecutive season. He's not only putting up the yardage, but Mayfield is targeting where it matters the most, and that is down in the red zone. Five receiving touchdowns. That is the seventh most in the league. Tennessee, they were allowing the 11th most receiving yards so far this season to wideouts and the seventh most fantasy points. So you do the math, bippity boppity boo, you add it all together. That is a huge week for Mike Evans. That should be more than enough to make you feel good about Mike Evans. But hey, if that's not enough, how about three straight games in which Mike Evans has produced at least 13 fantasy points? Yeah, booyah, grandma. Put Mike Evans into your lineup. And we talked about this earlier, and this one's caught me a lot of flack here right now. So I want to put this out there with a disclosure because right now, Jamar Chase still has not practiced. He was a DNP. So this is on the assumption that Jamar Chase is going to be ready to go this week. And that sit is going to be T. Higgins. Yes, I'm going there. I'm going T. Higgins this one. I'm expecting fireworks there in that Cincinnati-Houston game, but I think T. Higgins is that odd man out. Now, him being included is probably going to surprise a lot of people. What do you have, like eight grabs, 110 yards last week? But it's simple. We're looking for a correction here as Jamar Chase was only targeted eight times. He only hauled in four passes. He only had 41 yards. For the most for, the water, for a wide receiver who's always open 24-7, that is hugely disappointing. Now, before that eight-catch, 110-yard performance there, Higgins, Higgins, look, he had just 11 grabs in his previous four contests. And Houston secondary, Tara, they are one of the – they're like a bed but do not break type unit. They are allow, they've are only allowed like a pair of touchdowns, two wide receivers, and they're allowing less than 29 fantasy points per game. We talk about how good that Jets team is. Only the Jets have been better at defending fantasy wide receivers than the Houston Texans have been. So I'm just kind of putting that out there in that universe. And now I'll flip over and talk about these sits for me, uh, some additional sits at the wide receiver position. And that includes Devontae Adams. I'm hoping for a reverse jinx here. But, hey, if you've been hoping for the weekly projection to kick in for Devontae Adams any given week, it hasn't happened. He has underperformed those weekly projections each and every week, and I'm expecting that trend to continue here again this week against Sauce Gardner and the Jets. I'm also sitting Zay Flowers, another tough matchup against the Cleveland Browns, the Cleveland Browns team that is allowing just 145 passing yards per game, and opposing wide receivers have only got 970 receiving yards so far this year. Uh, Gabe Davis, he's got to be one of the most frustrating players in all of fantasy. I'm at the point where I'm willing to cut him. I don't care what he does on someone else's lineup. I don't want him anywhere near my lineup. So peace of mind is worth whatever you could possibly think of. And even over the last three weeks, we have seen 26 targets go to Dalton Kincaid. Um, We've seen Khalil Shakir have 18 receptions on the season with 14 of them coming over the last three weeks. Both those players have outperformed Gabe Davis over the last three weeks. Expect that trend to continue here as well. As for starts, how about the top two wide receivers on their respective teams? And that's Brandon Ayuk and Christian Kirk as the Jaguars face the 49ers. The 49ers, they love to run uh, zone defense about 75% of the time. Christian Kirk, he crushes zone defenses. As for Brandon Ayuk, look, the, the Jaguars have allowed nine touchdowns this season, which happens to be the eighth most in the NFL. They're allowing 36 fast points per game to the position, which is also inside the top 12. San Francisco, they may be getting Debo Samuel back, but I don't think it matters. 
Brock Purdy's guy is Brandon Ayuk. Now turn our attention finally to the tight ends to close out this show, Tara. Who are your tight end must start and must sit players? My must start is Jake Ferguson. It is time to buy into it and believe it. I know people don't want to, but this is what happens with Dallas tight ends. They, they emerge out of nowhere, seemingly. And they're not the high end Kyle Pitts, shiny toys for uh, shiny toys, tight ends, but they get the job done because Dak Prescott likes his tight ends. And earlier on, you know, Jake Ferguson's production was up and down a little bit. I feel like it was inconsistent because of a matchups and B they were kind of utilizing Luke Schoonemaker, not in terms of targets, but presence on the field. And what we've seen over the past several weeks is, we finally seen an increase in snap count for Jake Ferguson. He's sitting above that 80% mark now, and that's what we want to see out of our tight ends. We need you on the field with the opportunity. He's coming off of a strong performance, uh, seven receptions on 10 targets, 91 yards, one touchdown. That's two touchdowns um, in a row, two different weeks. So um, back to back. So Liking him in this matchup, you talked about Dak Prescott a little bit, this matchup against the New York Giants. Again, they're a struggling team. The only downside here with him and maybe Dak is that this game maybe gets out of hand and maybe we see like the first string team sitting in the fourth quarter. That could happen. But if that happens, then hopefully we had a strong game from Dak Prescott and Jake Ferguson. So that's what we're banking on here. My sit of the week is unfortunately a guy who was coming off of several strong performances. He's feeling like you can finally rely on him after a lot of inconsistency earlier on, a lot of that due to the absence of Deshaun Watson and him, David and Joku dealing with injuries, of course, from that you know, strange fire situation. But he's really come on strong in the past couple of matchups. Um, touchdown two weeks in a row, four receptions two weeks in a row. And you're feeling more comfortable with him. Three straight performances of double-digit targets. But it's this matchup with Baltimore. I talked about Baltimore early. The defense is real. They are for real. And I talked about Deshaun Watson being a sit. And unfortunately, David Njoku is right there with him. Maybe the only prayer of hope that we can have there is that maybe Amari Cooper has a bad game and targets just have to go to David Njoku. But at the same time, I just don't want to take that risk when we've got solid streaming options at tight end. So David Njoku is a sit for me. Yeah, the thing with Njoku there is he's facing a Ravens team that knows how to get after the quarterback. They lead the league in sacks. They got to the Cleveland Browns quarterback. I think it was uh, Thompson Robinson in the first go around there four times. Deshaun Watson's shoulder is still probably not 100%. So I'm going to take a guess that maybe Njoku sticks it around there and blocks a little bit more this week and helps with the pass protection. Jake Ferguson is one of the leading uh, tight ends there when it comes to red zone targets. So that's something we can count on pretty much each and every week. We can also count on Dalton Schultz versus the Cincinnati Bengals. This Texans offense, they're going to be able to exploit this Bengals uh, defense when it comes to tight ends. They are the fifth friendliest fantasy defense when it comes to tight ends, allowing more than 15 fantasy points per game. We know that Stroud, he spread the ball around nicely, including 11 targets to his tight end, who turned that into 10 catches, 130 yards, and 27 fantasy points. Now, fantasy... It can be frustrating, but guess what? It can be predictive. A good offense with a good tight end against a defense that struggles to defend tight ends means said tight end is a must start. It's really that simple. And this is the kicker here. After this week, get out of the Dalton Schultz business. We talk about must sell players. Dalton Schultz faces not only the Cleveland Browns, but the Tennessee Titans twice during the fantasy playoffs. The Titans and the Browns are the two best teams in fantasy at defending the tight end position. Uh, another tight end that I'm not starting this week is Kyle Pitts versus Arizona. Having Pitts in your fantasy lineup is basically a toxic relationship. Are you feeling left unhappy? Yes. Are you feeling a lack of support? Yes. Are you feeling somewhat disrespected? Yes. If you answered yes to any of those questions, guess what? You're in a toxic relationship, people. That is exactly what Arthur Smith and Kyle Pitts bring to your fantasy rosters. So you cannot get involved here. You cannot. And this week, he faces the Cardinals team allowing less than nine fantasy points per game to the position and have a yell allow just nine or two touchdowns and 352 receiving yards this season. Jonu Smith, yes, Jonu Smith has more targets inside the 20-yard line than Kyle Pitts, not to mention more receiving yards and more touchdowns. Look, 
Arthur Smith, he is fantasy kryptonite. Stay away. Just stay away. And some other tight ends you're staying away from this week include Cole Komet. He's been productive as of late, but Carolina, they're allowing just 9.65 fantasy points, two tight ends so far this season. And Luke Musgrave versus Pittsburgh. The good news for Packers fans is uh, Aaron Jones was unleashed and performed well last week. That's good for the Packers moving forward, but Pittsburgh is a tough matchup against tight ends. They are allowing uh, something like eight and a half fantasy points per game so far this season and are one of the top six units in that uh, respect. And starts Dalton Kincaid versus the Denver Broncos. Another great start. Even though he fumbled last week, he still produced 16 fantasy points. He had 10 catches there for 81 yards. The rookie sits second on this Bills team with 40 receptions. He's seen seven or more targets in three straight contests. He's done this all without Dawson Knox in the lineup and has earned a 22% target share and an 82% route participation on Josh Allen dropback. So you can trust him this week. Trey McBride, trust him against Atlanta. Even though Kyler Murray is just getting his first game back, it is an upgrade on Clayton Toon. Murray may not be fully back, but guess what? It's not going to matter. The Falcons defense is allowing 13.3 fantasy points per game to the tight end position. And Hunter Henry, we do not have a number one wide receiver there in New, New England. Is it Demario Douglas? Is it Ramondre Stevenson? Could it be Hunter Henry? Well, it could be Hunter Henry because the Colts are allowing 14.7 fantasy points to the position so far this season. And we know that Henry can be productive in PPR formats because the Colts are also allowing the fourth most receptions, 53 over the course of the season. So that's good news for people who are looking for a tight end to stream. Now, Tara, before I let you go, I need one sleeper player for week number 10. One sleeper player for week number 10. I should have been more prepared for this. Um, while I am thinking of my sleeper player, can you give yours? Absolutely. I am all in this week when it comes to the one and only Jonathan Mingo. Why? Because I talked about those guys who were injured for this Carolina Panthers team at the start of the show. One of those players that's injured who's out already is DJ Chark. And against this Bears team, I think Carolina is going to need to get the passing game going, which means we are going to get ourselves some Jonathan Mingo. And hey, he's been looking good as of late. Rookies always seem to perform after week number eight. So here's your chance to get Jonathan Mingo and feel good about it in your starting lineup. Got one now? Jackson Smith and Jigba. I know that he is third in the pecking order, but this could be a good matchup against Washington. Maybe Geno Smith takes advantage of it and can get a little something out of JSN. All right, Tara, let the people know where they can find you. You can find me on Twitter. It's Sarah Time. That is where you can find all of my work from Fantasy Pros and Player <laughs> player Profiler, um, all that good stuff. Four for four, just go to my Twitter. Well, Tara Roberts, I'm Matt Donnelly, and we will see you next week. <laughs>